Hi, um, so welcome to another 42 Courses podcast and uh, for the first time this year, a uh, huge warm welcome back to uh, the, the person who we all love the most, uh, Rory Sutherland. Uh, Rory, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, yeah, we just thought we'd, we'd, we'd say hi, catch up, nudge stocks on its way. Uh, so uh, we thought we could have a, a little chat about that and just before the call started, we were just uh, chatting about AI. Which, uh, which obviously features in that stock because it's <laughs> mandatory. And I, I think it's right to be both enthused by it because uh, well-directed, well-aligned AI, which is genuinely aligned with human interests, uh, the famous question in AI is the alignment problem, hmm. which is that we don't, we don't even know what we're trying to optimize ourselves, okay? So programming a device... Uh, to effectively improve human quality of life without that device somehow um, acquiring kind of, uh, you know, bizarre notions of its own, uh, you know, is difficult enough at the best of times. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I, th I think we're right for all kinds of reasons to be concerned about this, which is that, um, uh, you know, you know, you, you, if we click bait, which is generally, I think, still generated by humans for the most part. Uh, you know, there is the power just through what you might call incredibly accelerated evolution uh, for AI to develop the, you know, techniques of extreme manipulation, for example. Yeah. Um, but that's only, I mean, you know, I think that's possibly, that, although it could lead in politics, it could have absolutely catastrophic effects. But there's something there that is is definitely alarming. Now, we made the theme of Nudstock this year, by the way, about messiness. And one of the things this applies to AI as well, by the way, is one of the skills we think particularly valuable in behavioral science is being comfortable not knowing or being comfortable existing in a state of uncertainty right. for a reasonable length of time. Yeah. Typically beyond the deadline, by the way. You know, I think that's a message both for behavioral science. I think it's a message for solving problems in a complex domain. And I think it's a message also for creativity in general, in fact, uh, which is that I think one of the, I started reframing the question about creativity. And I started asking a different question, which is instead of how can we get more creativity, isn't creativity wonderful? Wouldn't it be lovely if we just had 5% more? It's to ask the opposite question, which is why is it that people are so comfortable being uncreative and going with, any solution that seems logical, even though better solutions almost certainly exist. So in other words, what I'm looking at is uncreativity and why it is that institutions seem to reward people for being uncreative. And I think the reason is that nobody in modern business can actually make a decision on their own. They'll always have to confer with finance, legal, HR, or whatever, which means they've got to win an argument. I don't actually make it. I'm the vice chairman of Ogilvy. I don't actually make any decisions at all. All I can do is make a case to somebody. Mm -hmm. And in the act of making a case to somebody, you've got to make it comprehensible, simple, linear, numerical, quantifiable. Okay? And the only things on which you can draw on for arguments are those things which effectively fit neatly into a spreadsheet or a model. Now, when we make decisions as consumers, I think we're instinctively quite creative because we actually, uh, we we think about things, uh, effectively, we somehow manage to resolve things which are not commensurable. Right. I, I always give this example, but I, I had to drive to Gatwick uh, the day before yesterday. And it was the old story, which is I went on the back road, even though the sat-nav wanted me to go on the M25. And the reason I went on the back road is because although it's slower, there's lower variance, or there's lower downside variance. In other words, if the M25 clogs up, I miss my plane. If I go on the A25, I might have to run to my plane, or I might have quite a lot of time to spare, but I'm very unlikely to miss it. Right. Because I have both less variance in journey time and more optionality should things go wrong. And we somehow manage, as humans, um, to make the trade-off between speed and variance or indeed you know do i want to save five minutes by going on a least less scenic route or 
Do I even take a slower route where I keep moving in preference to a faster route where I'm stationary for 15 minutes? You know, we somehow manage to make those decisions as humans. Hmm. Embracing a lot of effectively incomparable data and thoughts, which are impossible to make both in programming and in making an argument. Yeah, okay, because an argument has to have a QED. It has to have a single right answer. And we're generally operating in a domain as marketers where there's more than one right answer. There are many right answers. There are also answers which are less good in one specific way but might be more interesting, for example. You might make a trade-off between doing something logical, sensible, and boring and doing something slightly less logical, perhaps even slightly less effective, in one sense, in one dimension, but actually simply more interesting. Like, I guess technology is often made to optimize situations, but actually we don't we don't often want to optimize it, or the optimization might not be our best. It's optimizing route. the wrong thing, or it's optimizing too few things. And some of the AI doomsayers, who I think have this phrase where they call it the is it the golem or something, that let's say you have let's say you have a decision or a design or a product, okay, mm. which contains 27 variables. Right. And you optimize for 19 of them. It is an almost inevitable consequence that the eight remaining variables, which you haven't factored into your model, will become worse as a consequence of, of maximizing on the remainder and may become worse to the point of becoming absolutely terrible. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you imagine a car which was designed solely for performance, it would have appalling fuel economy. Okay? And if you had a design that was a car that was designed solely for fuel economy, it would have appalling performance. Yeah. Okay? And so if we, if we extend that upwards, wherever we're optimizing for a problem where essentially we don't have access to, can't quantify, or indeed can't influence a certain number of the relevant variables, and therefore we just optimize for the remainder. The odds are that it's a bit like, you know, uh, it's a bit like smoothing down wallpaper, that the bubbles move somewhere else and become larger in world. Yeah. And I can see that happening in all kinds of AI problems because it can only optimize for and consider the things it's been told to look at. And there may be elements that are hugely important to humans which can't actually be expressed, never mind in numbers, they can't even be expressed in words necessarily. Right. And so I think there is something, that, you know, there is something to be alert to about messiness, which is something about the human brain is quite clever in that it will immediately spot, well, largely spot, I would argue there are cases where it doesn't, you know, the higher education problem for example in the uk i don't think we spotted because we just went all education is good education adds value and it's indeed true that at an individual level it's better to be educated than not to be educated but nobody asked the question but what happens if you educate everybody do you just create an insane kind of arms race where now you know you you you, you barely raise an eyebrow unless you've got at least a phd you know yeah. You know, or do you end up with a world where nobody actually enters the workforce until they're 35 because they're so busy accumulating qualifications to get them that best entry-level job, even though in that job, four years later, no one gives a shit what qualifications they got in the first place? Yeah. And why is it that HR are so keen to use graduate degrees as a sorting hat? when actually there's not much evidence, there's all that much correlation between academic performance and workplace performance. You know, but, but there are cases, I think, where humans completely miss this, that we've effectively become fixated on one metric to the, to the exclusion of anything else, and it leads to grotesque distortion, hyper-competition, um, you know, over-exaggerated behaviours, gaming of the system, all kinds of things like that. Now, most of the time, humans spot, not all the time, because I, as I said, I don't think we have in, in education, for example, but most of the time, humans spot the fact that when they spot the moment when pursuing an apparently logical end leads to absurd consequences. You, you talked a little bit earlier about how um, 
you're saying even though you're the vice chairman, it's 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 uh, it's really hard sometimes to make decisions by yourself. You're often well, no, no, no. as a result, we we optimize for winning arguments, not for making decisions. I wondered why they... I don't think it's true to say that the best reasoned course of action is necessarily the best course of action. By the way, I wondered whether you'd had a, a good chat with uh, with our friend Jules Goddard on that uh, and uh, and messiness and creativity in the workplace. Because uh... well, I mean, the interesting thing with creativity is that you have an opportunity to be creative every time you make a decision, which is to take the habitual, logical, or normative best practice decision. Yeah, and simply ask if you can do better. Okay, mm. well, we've created a world in business where something that seems to make sense is assumed to be therefore rational and is assumed therefore to be right. Now, actually, you know, I mean, I, I was just looking at the WPP travel policy the other day, and I thought, well, an accountant has come up with this, which is, you know, you can travel first class on a train journey of three hours or more. You know, depending on the duration of your flight, this determines, well, yeah, okay, I mean, sort of, you know. But then I said, well, here you had an opportunity to actually reward length of service with Ogilvy, where you say, you know, in other words, after you've worked with Ogilvy for X years, you get to fly in a slightly better class piece of the, of the plane. Okay, There was a famous dot-com company which did that, and they had their annual meeting. And the office manager flew out in first class because she'd been there since the company was founded. And the chief executive flew at the back of the plane because he'd only just joined. But, you know, there's an opportunity there to do more work with what you're given. So, you know, what you've done is you've turned this into a policy simply through the lens of kind of acceptable cost control. But you have... And this is the question. I met a wonderful woman who did partnerships for UNESCO. And... um. She was given a load of crocs, basically, to give away to kids. And what was interesting is that, perfectly logically, you could have just given them to people without shoes, okay? No no one would fire you for that. No one would say, well, none of them seem dull thing to do. But she had a bigger idea. She went and gave them to schools and said, give the kids crocs on their first day at school, because then they'll go back home and all the other kids who didn't go to school on the first day will go, where did you get those shoes? They give them to you when you go to school. Maybe six more kids go to school to get their free crocs. Now they're habituated around going to school. They've shown themselves. Now, what you've done there is you have done the first job, which is providing foot protection to people with no shoes, which has all kinds of benefits in and of itself. But you've also killed two birds with one stone. You've got it to do double duty. You know, the smarter kind of millionaire doesn't give money to charity the smarter millionaire says, I'll promise to match donations up to, you know, $1 million. Because that way you get $2 million for the cost of one. And no one, no one really looks at the uncreative solution uh, with any kind of dissatisfaction. Because and ad agencies have probably made this worse because they've sold creativity as something rare and mysterious. I don't think it is. I think most people have the power... Um, if they create the right environment and if they operate in the right context, in the right culture, I think most people have the power to make every decision 25% better, better than it needs to be. Yeah, I love the school example. It reminded me a bit of the sort of nine enders uh, that I think Richard Schotten talks about a lot. You know, the sort of, if you're, in, if, you're, if you're 29 or 39, you're much more likely to take up a new habit uh, or run a marathon. Ah, yes, I remember this, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's sort of one of the, those kind of key moments where if you if you make an intervention at one point, it can have a, a ginormous ripple effect. Funnily enough, I remember Martin Sorrell saying the same thing that he wondered whether he needed a policy for. I think it might have been forty nine year olds or something, mm -hmm. because he noticed a whole load of people. It was definitely either thirty nine or forty nine, and because he noticed a whole load of people having a kind of career crisis. Precisely at that point, <laughs> did he do anything? Or did he... I can't remember. He only mentioned it as a as a hypothetical. Nothing. This was years ago, but uh, I always thought it was an interesting insight then. And he'd obviously got the data as a you know to spot that this was happening. Did you get to catch up with him at Cannes? I didn't see him, unfortunately. No, um, I obviously saw Mark quite a bit. Yeah, uh, but I, I I never made it to the Media Monks Cafe. 
Yeah, their uh, their fun bar. I think they did that last year as well. It's brilliant. Um, so with uh, going back to Nudstock, are there any um, any sort of favourite well, speakers? But, much but like we've got data visualisation. We've got uh, auditory branding. Uh, we've got Marianne Seekart. We've got Paul Zach, who does um, a neuroscientist who also measures emotional response. Yeah, which I think is genuinely important because finally we might start to get metrics. I mean, not that we've had sort of galvanic skin response and all that sort of stuff for a while. Yeah, but it is interesting the idea that you can properly quantify. Um, emotional responses. In a sense, it's the emotional response that determines the behavior. Yeah. I mean, I think, don't get me wrong, I think it's mediated by rational evaluation. But I think ultimately, unless you feel emotionally predisposed to doing something, um, you can have all the reasons in the world and you're still not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and with the... the you. I mean, we talked a little bit about AI. Were there any other sort of big, big key things you were finding at uh, at, at Can this year uh, that, that sort of been? Uh, I was surprised there was less than I expected about Apple Vision. Okay, which may simply be a factor of time, which is that Apple Vision only came out a few weeks before the festival, mm. and that to me, the dog that doesn't bark in the night every time is the mention of Zoom and video conferencing, and um. Uh, user-generated video. And obviously TikTok was very much in evidence. So it was YouTube, and particularly TikTok. Um, but my point is that I would argue that in any B2B context, okay, which includes being an advertising agency, by the way, yeah, the potential offered by uh, everything from webinars to Zoom meetings, in other words, to export your skills to markets that previously you couldn't really practically serve, or it was simply too risky to pitch to. Mm. Um, so I would have had the potential to rework how you work in teams so that Ogilvy can finally deliver the promise of what we call long corridors, you know, where whichever country you're in, you behave as though you're all on the same corridor. I, I, but I think there's a faddish thing, which is that AI, there was less talk, by the way, markedly less talk about the metaverse. Yeah. A lot uh, than anyone would have expected, which is possibly because people realized it might have slightly jumped the shark in terms of the hype cycle. Yeah. Um, but I, I, there was much less about the metaverse. There was nothing much about Apple uh, Vision. And uh, that, as I said, Apple Vision only really got launched at what, two weeks, maybe, maybe even less before maybe the that's your so. first class air travel uh, alternative. Uh, give, uh, if, you, if you want a really good meeting, you could give your. The two, the two senior people uh, just send them a, an Apple Vision. <laughs> uh, well, well, you could have an Apple Vision in economy, which recreated the feeling of a, of a, of a first-class cabin. Right. I did have a conversation in Cannes because I wasn't entirely sure, uh, and I'm still not entirely sure, that the thing needs to be 3D. I can see the value of something. It could even be a monocle and, or a Google Glass-like thing which effectively gives you the portable equivalent of a 55-inch screen or a 65, 75-inch screen. Yeah. One of the sim simplest products, it was very interesting that very few companies actually seem to encourage this. One of the simplest ways to improve your productivity massively is to use multiple large monitors. Right. It has a spectacular effect on people's productivity. And so... The only question I asked was, does this need to be 3D? Okay. And my friend, uh, who uh, previously worked for Gymshark and before that for Nike, my friend said there is one killer application for 3D, which is certain sports. So the ability to watch a cricket match as though you were the umpire or to watch a basketball match as though you had re um, courtside seats. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and the ability just to move around if you wanted to and watch a sporting event from different angles, particularly if live, that I can see as being potentially a you know a kind of killer application. Yeah. Um, there are still wide open questions about how long people will wear it for, whether, as Scott Galloway believes, you simply become awkward and feel threatened if you lose your peripheral vision. Um, how does it work in video conferencing? In other words, how does it fill in my face? Does it do that artificially? 
using effectively some sort of skin you know, device that recreates my eyes mm. and somehow animates them appropriately. Well, it's got enough cameras to do that and enough processing power, certainly. It, it does that already. You, you, oh. you have to scan using an iPhone. Uh, your face and then it creates a 3d model of it so when you're speaking to someone else you have a 3d lifelike avatar that freaky apparently you can do that apparently with eye chat can't you or something is that right to a to a lesser degree i think you agree yeah um but no, i mean it's it's, but, it's a fascinating time to be alive i mean since <laughs> since you've joined the market the the marketing world or the advertising world technology yeah. is uh, changed an awful lot. I mean, I guess uh, out of all the things you've you've witnessed changing so far, what are the things that have remained constant? And perhaps what's the one thing that you think is you're you're really happy that has changed? One thing that I'm mixed about, which again I don't think gets commented on enough, is in the last ten to fifteen years the extraordinary dominance of English as a language. True. Yeah. Um, which, with a few exceptions, and ironically, the countries in Europe, Italy, Spain, Germany, France, which 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 um, dub rather than subtitling uh, films, a decision, by the way, that was taken in about 1929, which countries dub and which countries subtitle. Right. And it's actually a very sticky decision because... People get used to one or the other, and whereas in Britain we regard dubbing as absolutely comical, except in cartoons, obviously, where yeah. everything's dubbed anyway. Yeah. Um, and in you know, in other countries they find subtitles unbelievably painful. But that's that's something I'm mixed about because obviously individually and selfishly I'm a beneficiary. Okay. Yeah. But the extent to which all conversations between all nationalities now take place in English. Now not just in can, I mean just in the general business world, is something I'm a little bit upset about in a way, because although I benefit personally as a native English speaker, there's a bit of me which would value more biodiversity in such things a little bit. Um, yeah. One of the other things, I mean, it's, there's one way of looking at the advertising industry, which is to say that not much has changed. You know, you had the separation of media agency and creative agencies, which I still maintain was a very silly idea. Agree. Um, you had the shift from payment by commission to payment by the hour, and um, I suppose you also had a kind of rising procurement role. But those are the three really, really big things in terms of the business world. The the biggest thing I think that I um, that hasn't changed, which should have changed, is that agencies did not use payment by the hour as an opportunity to fundamentally reinvent whom they engaged with what kind of problems they solve and how they approach problems because suddenly by being paid by the hour many in many many ways were far worse than commission all by the yeah. matter of ways but the one thing it allowed you to do was actually deploy creativity in situations where the solution didn't involve giving a lot of money to rupert murdoch right and i think the muscle memory of agencies was so strong they just kept on doing what they were doing the other thing I'd like to see more of, which has died, is I'd like to see more category advertising coming back. Because I think things like environmentalism, um, you know, sustainable packaging, things like that. And fortunately, the Coke client agreed with me on this when I asked a question about it. She agreed in saying that it will only really be achieved when you actually have um, a consortia of conventionally competing brands all working to the same end, and indeed communicating collectively. Mm. So if you take, let's say, P&G versus Unilever in the field of fabric conditioner, okay, no one can be the person to go to concentrates first. Because you, you lose your facings, you lose your prominence on the shelf, you lose your perceived value for money by making the product smaller. Therefore, if one person jumps first, the other person becomes a beneficiary. So no one's going to jump. So the ability of actually creating, I would say, multi-brand communication campaigns around things like environmental questions or indeed car electrification. I don't think we're going to save the world one brand at a time. And so that's another thing I'd like to see more of. And the other thing I don't see enough of, actually, um, is... 
one. I, I don't see quite as many warm emotional campaigns that, you know, that sort of mass, you know, that tweak at your heartstrings. I don't think the use of music is as good as it could be. Things like that. Um, <laughs> but but the good thing I saw at Cannes, which I think we have to praise, is that, uh, you know, in the last, getting on for 10 years, you know, maybe, okay, let's say 15 years, it's gone from being a predominantly film festival with some press and outdoor to what is genuinely a festival of creativity in that some of the best ideas that, you know, were bubbling up in things like the titanium category weren't yeah. really communication ideas at all. They were just brilliant business ideas. That was the Dan Wyden thing he he was, he identified. that There was some advertising that, that didn't fit into any traditional categories, so it was him who... He wanted to create the, uh, or came up with the idea of creating a titanium award, and and obviously with him passing uh, away earlier, they they named it after him now. So it's the Dan Wyden Titanium. Ah, now you see, because Sir John Hegarty said the same thing. He said the most interesting work often defies easy categorization. Right. right. And one of the things, having been on the jury myself, I mean jury president of the Direct Lions, you will get two or three people in the jury. Sometimes I think it's an ulterior motion because they want to kill a bit of work for a competitor, okay, mm-hmm. who become category purists and say, this doesn't really belong in this category. I think it really should be. And sometimes, by the way, you have we have suggested when I was on the jury moving it to a different category because we thought it was mm-hmm. misentered, but, but it deserved recognition. Mm-hmm. But you did get that problem famously going back to about, I don't know, 2001 or something with BMW Films. Yeah. Which were, uh, I, I remember describing this to a younger audience, which were films which were uploaded to the internet for people to watch. But you've got to remember this was, I guess, pre YouTube or something. I remember old it's young pre-YouTube. people thinking, what, what, what the hell are you talking about? Films uploaded to the internet for people to watch. But BMW got great film directors, sort of Guy Ritchie, et cetera, to make short films with celebrities. I think Guy they, Ritchie's they, featured Madonna, yeah. which featured BMW. So, okay. And the truth of the matter was no one knew where it belonged. So if you're not careful, you fall between two stools or slip between the cracks. And the most interesting work, which quite often is at the intersection of two different things, ends up not getting noticed. And they've they've just relaunched uh, a second version of BMW Films this year. Uh, so the, I think the, how are they doing it? They're, presumably, I won't have to download the film. I'm, no, no, no. This, the, the, yeah, because I think last time it was on the BMW website, and you had to go there and then uh, and then got it download it or, or upload it. Yeah, it was Clive Owen, and I mean, loads of amazing actors and directors. It's incredible. Um, I think you're right with the with the emotion thing. I think it. I remember when I first sort of got into advertising and looked at Lions or, or Can. It was always. Um, there was lots of sort of uh, almost the stuff that was winning was often, I don't know whether this is the, a, a heinous thing to say, almost too creative. It was sort of almost creativity for creativity's sake. Yes, and actually, funnily enough, you can become, you can almost become so creative that the um, you, that, that the audience no longer participates in your work. It's work that's designed to be admired Right. Rather than work that moves, right. and I think and there's a great, by the way, great comment about that, mm. uh, which someone talked about when they talked about woke comedy. Okay, they said that you. Um, one of the things they noticed is that when you got comedians making political points, okay, which generally chimed with what their audience believed, it wasn't met with laughter; it was met with applause, and they said. The trouble is, as a comedian, you're really supposed to be making people laugh, not making people clap. Mm. And I think there's work there that sometimes, if you like, makes people clap, but doesn't make people laugh or love or buy, indeed. Yeah. And occasionally, occasionally I get cross because as a copywriter, uh, you know, if I, let's say I open some piece of copy with, it is a truth universally acknowledged, okay? Right. Uh, you know, I would immediately get shot down because people would say, look, only 3% of people know Jane Austen or whatever it might be, or this is far too Radio 4 for our target audience or blah, 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 blah. But sometimes you're allowed to rely on levels of visual literacy. I mean, I have to confess, every year at Cannes, there are two or three ads where I just go and look at it and go, sorry, what am I missing here? 
you know, this is too, you know, this this is beautiful if you know if you know what you're looking for. But if you're just on your way to work and it's a cross track, you haven't got the time to assume that it's a work of genius. Mm. Okay. I think, and and as a result, there is work that. Having said that, there are a lot of. Fa- it's a much much better panoply of interesting and great ideas uh, than when it was confined to one medium. Um, I know that the organisers partly did that for reasons of self interest. I'm sure. But it has had good consequences in that creatives are now incentivized to have ideas, not just to. Um, but um, I wouldn't mind the odd 1980s TV commercial nestling in there somewhere. I have to admit. We yeah. we, we made a uh, a, a free course um, on celebrating 70 years of Can Lions. So we went back into the archive and found ads from the 50s until today. We found all the Grand Prix and we sort of put a selection of four or five of them in each of the lessons so you can see the evolution of advertising. I think my sort of overall was it started off for a few interesting observations. One was I think it was advertising back in the day um, around sort of the, the 70s, 80s seemed to be quite quite brilliant in my word. That was, that was probably my favorite and that it was quite clear that it was an ad and it was done with humor, it was done with emotion. And then we kind of went super purpose driven. And I, I feel like now we're slowly going back to more emotive, more practical ads that actually try and help sell something. But yeah, I thought entertain. purpose was one of those things, which is it's quite good if it's your property, but if everybody else does it, yeah. you end up basically saying the same thing. I mean, it's worth noting that Winston Fletcher wrote a book back in the 80s called How to Capture the Advertising High Ground which was all about promoting and owning a higher order benefit. Right. And it's something that certain brand leaders, I think, can do. Yeah. Okay. Great. So as the brand leader, you promote what you might like, the highest order version of the category benefit. Okay. Right. And, you know, Nike can kind of do that. Apple can kind of do it. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, wow. What you can't do is do that if you're number seven in the category. You know, if you're an also ran a bit part player, um, you know, in a, in a weird kind of way, you know, Coke can do it, Dr. Pepper can't. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think, I mean, Dove did it, but Dove, it was extremely relevant to the category, okay? Yeah. It wasn't saying Dove's going to save the world. It wasn't, you know, it was simply saying that, uh, and it also, it came out of what was different about the product. The product was largely yeah. unscented, unfussy. It was beauty without artifice, that I think mm-hmm. At one stage, the kind of defining property of the brand, mm. and therefore going against the what you might call the, you know, the many many competitors that, of, uh, you know, hardcore cosmetic competitors was an entirely appropriate thing to do in that case, and it was a big enough brand to carry it off. Yeah. Okay. But but I but I think I think that purpose thing was a massive distraction to some extent because. It actually led, it, what was intended as a distinguishing characteristic led to all advertising becoming the same. And, you know, to some extent, not many brands have the license to tell me how to think. Yeah. And I'll, you know, and so as a behavioral scientist, I'd also talk about things like reactance theory, which is that some of those ads got the tonality right, okay, which is like, we're helping you do this, okay. There were other ads, probably the two most famous would be the Gillette one. Um, I don't think, by the way, I don't accept the, um, the, the, call, the, the, the Bud Light one because that was a piece of, of influencer marketing, which was, I think, deliberately misrepresented by the right-wing press to stir up controversy by more or less suggesting that Dylan Mulvaney was the new face of Bud Light, which I you know. Yeah. It was really it, it was simply a piece of influence and marketing. There was nothing more than that. They'd produced some, you know, cans in a small run with her face in it. Um uh and I think, you know, they managed to get people to who who are in the willful misunderstanding business, you know, the selective outrage business. Um but the, the Gillette thing was heavy handed, I thought it was it was um uh because that was getting to the point where you were actually doing the one thing you must never do, which is really to insult your target audience. Um, yeah, it's an interesting. And that that wasn't far from doing that, you know. 
What was your um out of any ads either that you saw at Can or just any any ads recently? What's your sort of favourite ad that used a behavioural science insight very cleverly um, at all recently? Oh, um, uh, uh, in terms of ads, um, I think uh, there was a particularly good example. I'm just trying to, uh, which I saw the other day, and I'm just trying to remember it. Um, but, the, um, the one, the the one where uh, in the last few years, there's a beautiful one, which is a perfect case of reframing, which was for Renault electric cars, um, uh, which showed someone getting up in the morning and all their electrical devices being petrol powered. So they kind of yeah. they they started their toothbrush as if it was a lawnmower and so forth. Um, uh, uh, you know, that's a beautiful case where you simply make the absolutely inarguable point that everything else that moves in your life has become electrified, okay? And therefore, it, your car and perhaps your lawnmower are the two, you know, are the two remaining anomalies uh, and the only anomalies that remain. So that was a brilliant case of reframing something to normalise it. I thought that was tremendous. That's quite a few years ago now, but... Uh, it was just something that sprang to mind because I've just been on a on a podcast about car electrification and the advertising challenge that poses. Um, there is a fantastic case where I'm just trying to remember the details where the idea. Well, I'll give you a lovely case, which is pure alchemy, which is Ogilvy Honduras. There's a part of Honduras where, for reasons I don't fully understand, something to do with water spouts, fish fall from the sky. Wow. And the locals had always eaten these fish and just treated them very much as fish. It was a coastal area anyway. And in working with a local, um, uh, uh, working with a local fish um, uh, trader, market trader, they rebranded it as Heaven Fish and charged a premium for it. <laughs> Which amazing. is, you know, I, I remember talking to a guy, uh, you know, exactly the same case where I remember talking to a guy where he, um, was selling baobab from various Zimbabwean farmers. You, you can't really farm baobab, so it's quite good because the village that has a lot of baobab trees gains a source of income if you sell baobab fruit. Right. And he happened to mention that some of the trees are over a thousand years old. And I said, are you selling the, fa the fruit from a thousand year old trees alongside and mixing it up with the 300 year old trees? Yep, it's all the same baobab. And I said, you're nuts, okay? Anybody pay a premium. And it's pure James Webb Young, what he did with apples. Yeah. He bought an apple farm in, um, after he retired from J. Wells Thompson, he bought an apple farm in New Mexico. But unfortunately, at high altitude, early hailstorms in the season pitted the apples. So no conventional buyer wanted to buy them. And instead, he sold them by mail order as authentic high altitude New Mexico apples. And he made the sort of golf ball pitting a feature, not a bug. And that's, you know, that's a, the, those cases are wonderful cases where you, you know, I, I always thought, you know, anybody would, anybody would kind of pay a premium to know they were making a smoothie. Bear Bab was pretty good for smoothies, by the way. Making a smoothie with, a, you know, uh, from a tree that was effectively, you know, sprouting somewhere in Zimbabwe, uh, you know, while Jesus was alive, you know, <laughs> or, or, or they'd pay a premium, you know, a pre-Norman conquest bear bab, you know, you just won. Absolutely. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll look at look for those. Let's get some smoothies ready for Nudstock uh, with a thousand-year-old uh, baby Jesus mm. uh, bear bab fruit. Um, <laughs> so, um, any uh, any any? I know we're, we're sort of running out of time, but any uh, last words? Uh, on, yeah, on... Um, just to say um, uh, that. Uh, we're more or less sold out of Nudstock tickets, the physical tickets. Uh, the whole device is being streamed. Just go to nudstock.com. You'll find all the details there. Mandatory plug for the website. Uh, I kick off the day. Um, there'll be a mixture of uh, me and Dan and Tara. Um, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all be presenting and hosting and emceeing the event. Uh, there are eight to ten absolutely, actually more than that, but absolutely fantastic speakers. There's some fantastic businesses we've got in to present. Uh, it's probably this year 
is a bit more applicable and a bit less theoretical than in previous years, which is probably a response a little bit to consumer demand. Oh, marvelous. And uh, and if you go there, we'll, we'll see you there too as well. It will be a joy. I'd love to see as many of you there as you possibly can. Once again, it's at the Truman Brewery. Let's get this right. Not the brewery. It's at the um, old Truman Brewery in Brick Lane. And foods by Dishoom. I forgot to mention that because if there's no, even if you have no interest in behavioral science whatsoever and you think we're all total bullshitters, there's still food by Dishoom. Enjoy that. Um, thanks so much. And, uh, and yeah, uh, I'll chat to you soon. Always a pleasure, Chris. Absolute joy. Thank you.